Welcome to the 409th episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. Stay tuned for my interview with writer Gene Hemp Korolitz, author of the new novel, The Plot. Stay tuned for the interview. The Reading and Writing Podcast is brought to you by Libro FM. Libro.fm lets you purchase audiobooks directly from your favorite local bookstore. You can pick from more than 185,000 audiobooks, including bestsellers and recommendations from booksellers. You'll get the same audiobooks at the same price as the largest audiobook company out there, but you'll be part of a different story one that supports your local community and your local bookstore. If you're new to audiobooks, they're the perfect way to get more books into your busy life. You can listen during your commute, while doing chores, walking the dog, or just relaxing at home. All you need is a smartphone and the free Libro.fm app. If you already love audiobooks and don't know what to listen to next, check out recommendations and curated lists from people who know audiobooks best, your local bookseller. Here's your special offer from the Reading and Writing Podcast. Get two audiobooks for the price of one today with your first month of membership with the code RWPODCAST at checkout. This offer is only valid for new members in Canada and the U.S., Check out Libro.fm today. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Gene Hemp Corlitz, author of the new novel, The Plot. Stephen King recently raved about the plot on Twitter, and the novel has been mentioned on numerous book lists, including being named by the Wall Street Journal as one of the nine best books of the spring. Gene, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Great. If someone hasn't heard about your new novel, The Plot, yet, how would you describe the novel? For me, this novel was inextricable from the circumstances in which it was written. There was a pandemic on, and I don't know if you've heard about that, but yes, <laughs> that consuming thing about a year ago. And just before it began, I, I, I was actually in my editor's office having a conversation about a different novel that was not working. And in the middle of this meeting, I just upchucked this whole idea uh, to my editor. And we ended up putting aside the other novel and focusing on this one. And then everything shut down. I was in a remote house in upstate New York. And with this assignment and a very propulsive plot that really was calling out to be written, it was very, it it was so irritating. it was so it was harder not to write it than to write it and for those of your listeners who are writers you know what that means because it's awfully hard to write anything i spent the pandemic or the first 6 months of the pandemic writing this novel and i was grateful for it every day because it really was an escape from what was happening i was a very scared person during those months i was a very angry person during those months and i'm so grateful that i had this thing that was getting me out of bed every morning and forcing me to work every single day. But what is it about? Perhaps <laughs> perhaps that's one of the question. Um, th- this is a novel that's really about some of the things that writers obsess about. I'm, I guess I'm about to find out whether people who are not writers also obsess about these things. But in, in a way, it's this one's really for the writers in my life. And it's about a writer who does something that is either wrong or not wrong. And I'm not sure I even, after all this time, have uh, a definitive opinion. Uh, It's still a gray area for me. What he does is he takes a story that he did not create. He takes a story that another writer is working on, but then that writer dies and he is compelled to write his own novel with this plot, this story. He does not copy a word from another person. He does not copy any kind of distinguishing description of a character. He writes his own novel, but he has taken the story. And as this is something that we writers do all the time, we adapt stories, we repurpose stories, we retell stories. This is part of the great continuum of fiction as well as the other arts. And there was absolutely nothing wrong with it. 
However, once his book is published and he has achieved a great, a stunning amount of fame and, and uh, approbation, he's contacted by somebody who knows exactly what he did. And that person is very angry. And so begins a cat and mouse unfolding of this story in which our hapless protagonist has to figure out who's tormenting him and come to some sort of understanding about what it is that he's actually done. Well, you mentioned writing the plot during the pandemic and it served as an escape for you. Is this the first time that you've used fiction writing as an escape before? I didn't knowingly do it. (laughs) I I would, if given the choice, I would have done without writing this novel, if I could have also done without the pandemic. It, It really, it was just a kind of fortunate juxtaposition of unignorable forces in my life, one extremely public and one very private. I am a fearful person. I was one of those people who was worried about what was happening in China months before things shut down. And I spent a lot of time really dreading what might be about to happen. And then when it actually did happen, I I was just so happy that I had this other thing that was taking my mind off it. But I certainly didn't set it up that way. As you mentioned with the plot, you have an MFA professor who steals the plot of a deceased student. I'm curious in your own writing life, how do ideas and plots for new novels germinate for you? It's a really good question. And in my, I've now written seven novels plus a few that were not published. And for me, it's been across the, bo- across the, the gamut. I've had novels that dropped into my head from nowhere, and the plot was one of them. And I've had novels that I literally spent 20 years thinking about before I wrote a word. I wrote a novel called The White Rose, which literally 20 years went by, not even writing anything, just thinking about what that novel would be like. And then then I started writing it shortly after September 11th. I I guess you could say that was another novel that I was very happy to be working on because it took me out of some really unhappy times. But mostly, it, for me, it's a kind of a what-if question. I start thinking about, what if I took this idea and I set it in this place with these characters? And I have reused plots. The White Rose, for example, was a, a retelling of an opera called De Rose and Cavalier, which was written by Richard Strauss and set in the 18th century, although it was written in the early 20th century. It also, in turn, was based on a novel that was written in the 18th century. Probably that novel was based on something else. So that's what I mean when I, you know, talk about these continuums. That's probably not the right construction. The continuum can see I didn't do a lot of stories. That was The White Rose. I wrote another novel called The Sabbath Day River, which incorporated a lot of The Scarlet Letter. I'm comfortable with the idea of reinventing existing stories. To me, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. However, what the character in the plot does is a little more suspect, um, and he does it knowing that it's probably wrong. So I think that's probably the biggest indication of all, that he's vulnerable to the later anonymous assaults that he undergoes. Gotcha. So what was your original writing journey that led you to writing and getting your first novel published? I was one of those really boring people who just knew from the (laughs) get-go what I was supposed to do. And... I loved, I was a great reader. I read everything. I'm a big proponent of reading crappy books as well as great books. I read crappy books and great books. To me, writing a novel was just the highest thing I could ever aspire to. And although there's some comfort in knowing what it is you want to do and having a chance to start early and prepare for something like this, there there are a lot of other challenges like failure is a huge fear. It's failure, the fear of failure figures very large in the plot. So even though I started early and even though I, you know, studied English and read hand over fist constantly and thought about writing fiction all the time, I was pretty apprehensive about actually trying it. I was afraid to fail and I spent a lot of time writing poetry before I actually got up the nerve to try to write a novel. And I think that that helped me in the end because poetry really teaches you to respect language and to listen to the way words sound as well as just thinking about what they mean. 
So in practical terms, all the normal boring stuff, I majored in English. <laughs> I went to graduate school for two years in England. And that's when I really wrote the last of my poems. After that, I came back to America and I was working as an editorial assistant at Ferrar Strass and Giroux. So this is when I was at starting to write fiction, writing my first novels, which were not published. And I would spend my days literally writing other people's rejection letters. And then I would be getting my own rejection letters once I started sending out my manuscripts. So it was a pretty... <laughs> it's a pretty gruesome time. One, one thing I did learn is that rejection letters don't mean anything at all. Anybody who reads a rejection letter for a reason why their book has been rejected is just, a, it's a waste of time. Don't even bother. How did you manage that fear of failure? And you were talking about working at um, FSG and dealing with your own rejection letters. What kind of kept you going and how did you manage that? I, I just think I was too... <sighs> As scared as I was to go forward, I was too scared to give up to. At some point, whatever gets you to the table, the table at which the writing happens, don't question it too much because if you're getting the words on the page, you are working towards becoming a better writer. And I, after my third novel was accepted for publication, I eagerly went back and reread numbers one and two. And I thought to myself, no, I, I have gotten better. I have improved. And this... I was almost glad that those first two books had not been published because I think I would not have had the career that I've been able to have. Although at the time I was very jealous of my peers <laughs> who were getting published and sailing into print, a lot of them aren't around anymore. And I am. I was, what's that fairy tale about the, what is it, the rabbit and the grasshopper or something like that? Anyway, slow and steady. Or the I'm tortoise still- and the hare. Thank you. The yes. tortoise and the hare. Well, given the title of your book, The Plot, Do you plot extensively on your own novels before you sit down to write the first word? Actually, I don't. I I don't. It doesn't really start with the plot for me. It starts with the kind of what if. And often there is a template of another plot that I'm working with, like De Rosen Cavalier or The Scarlet Letter. But I I have never sat down and said, this is going to happen, then that's going to happen. And often when you're right, when you're beginning your book, you don't know everything that's going to happen, nor should you. Because if you do, the writing tends to have this sort of connect the dots staleness and predictability about it. And I I feel that's, I can sense it if I'm reading a novel where A leads to B, leads to C, leads to D. You can almost see the the index cards on somebody. It's really hard to explain to people who have not had this experience themselves. You have the sense of where you're going, Mm -hmm. but don't know too much. And when you're in that kind of sweet spot between ignorance and knowing everything, that's when you start writing. And even as you're writing, you're trying not to think too far ahead because you have to trust that the, the right thing will be revealed. That sounds very spiritual and I'm anything but spiritual, but (laughs) I'm sure if you've talked to a lot of writers, which obviously you have, you you probably have a nice file full of writers' metaphors, and it's macheting your way through the forest. It's chipping away at a boulder. It's my particular metaphor has to do with driving on Third Avenue in New York City, where the the lights seem. If you hit the right speed, you the light turns green as you arrive at it. Right. And so you can't see all the way ahead of you. You can't see 10 blocks ahead. You can't see what's at the end of Third Avenue. You, you can see the next block or two. And when you, your car gets there, the light turns green. And as hard as it is to continue without knowing everything that's going to happen, this is part of the discipline of the exercise. This is what we train for. You, to change the subject to, for a moment, you created Book the Writer, a pop-up book group in New York City. How does Book the Writer work? Oh, I'm, thank you so much for asking. Many years ago, <laughs> when I lived in Princeton, New Jersey, I had, I called it the Meet the Author Book Club. And we would read a book, and I would invite the author down to Princeton, usually from New York. And everybody would buy the book, and we would discuss the book with the author. And I did this as a benefit for a local charity and went on for about 
five or six years and we had a lot of fantastic authors come down and you, you might well think what's in it for a well-known author to travel on New Jersey transit for an hour <laughs> and uh, not be paid. But for most of us, it is worth it. It is a big deal to be in a room full of intelligent readers who've all gone out and bought your book. Not all of us are David Sedaris or Dean Koontz. And it's a big deal to, to um, have that support from, from readers. And I was sometimes shocked at the people who accepted my invitation. Almost everybody did. And then when I moved to New York, I thought maybe I can see if this will work as some kind of a business. So the first orientation or the first version of Book the Writer, as the name Book the Writer suggests, was that I was sending authors to existing book groups. You could quote unquote book the writer was my husband's my husband named the company. <laughs> and this did not work. And the reason it didn't work was that groups, it's very difficult to get a group to agree on anything, especially when there's money involved. This is what I discovered. And I started hearing a lot of, I would come, I love this idea, but I can't get my the rest of my book group to agree. So I decided to flip the concept. And now I set up the events. I set the author, the book, the date, and then people just sign up and come if they're interested. And that really did work. And we had about three or four fantastic years of meetings in New York apartments. And then when the pandemic happened, I took a deep breath and we went online. And we've been doing these over Zoom. And I have to say, I was very skeptical, but it's been great. And we've had, we've had readers participating from literally all over the world. And that has been super exciting. So now we're getting ready to return to real rooms in New York City this fall. We've got still another 10 or so events over the summer, and anybody can sign up for them and, and register. There's a small fee, and we expect you to buy and read the book. And then you're on Zoom with David Duchovny or Anna Quinlan or whoever the author is, and we talk about the book. That sounds great. If someone's interested in that, should they just go to bookthewriter.com to yeah, find out about events? Bookthewriter.com. It's all one word. And there are links on the website to our Eventbrite page, which has all of the registrations on it. Right. You can also, and you should also sign up for our mailing list because then you'll hear from me whenever new events are scheduled. Great. Well, what writing advice would you offer for those who are working on their own stories and novels and maybe getting some of those rejection letters that you mentioned earlier? Rejection is not fun, but it's a rare author who escapes without experiencing it. And frankly, some of the ones who do experience it, who you say, this person just <laughs> soared out of nowhere and they're shortlisted for the National Book Award. I'm actually thinking of one author who we had an event with a couple of years ago who seemed to come out of nowhere and whose book won everything or was a bestseller and was shortlisted for everything. And there was a certain gnashing of teeth that was going on. But in our event, in our pop-up book group, she began to tell us about all the books she'd written that had all been rejected. And wow. um, so you don't know. You don't know if somebody's quote unquote first novel is their first or their 10th. If they're the rare person who comes out of obscurity and with a brilliant first novel and somebody recognizes that and buys it and Oprah chooses it or whatever your personal fantasy of success is, more power to them. You, you, most of us, it's not like that. And you just, you have to do the work. There's just, there's no way around it. And I, I happen to not be a, an encourager of self-publishing. I think if your book is rejected as many times as my first two were, the lesson from that is that you need to go and write a better book. And as horrible as that sounds and as horrible as it feels, you want your book to be, you want your first book, you want all your books, but I think especially your first book to be just the greatest thing anybody has ever read. And if that's not the book that keeps coming back from publishers, you got to write another one. That's great advice. What novels or nonfiction books have you read recently that you enjoyed? Oh, I've been reading everything I can, everything I haven't already read about plagiarism. And I'll, I'll read anything about plagiarism or writers anyway, because I find them interesting. But there was a book I just read that I couldn't believe I had missed. It's called A Ladder to the Sky, and it's by a Irish novelist whose name I'm not remembering. He's the guy who wrote um, The Boy in the Striped Pajamas. Oh, yeah. John, 
sorry, I'm madly looking on my phone right now. Ladder to the sky. I, it was just fantastic. It was so much fun. And it, the name of the author is John Boyne. There you go, John Boyne. So I thought that was terrific. But I, I read constantly. I read four or five books a week, and I'm always listening to a book as well as reading one or two or three. Where can people find you online if they want to learn more about you and your novels? I do have a website that is boringly named jeanhampcorlitz.com. It's got a nice picture of my dog on the landing page. I'm sure that will be very satisfying to anybody who likes dogs. I am not, I'm technically on Facebook, but I, I've never understood Facebook. It defies me. I, I can't make it, I cannot understand it. Right now, the Facebook page is being managed by my publisher. I don't know what I'm going to do when they relinquish it. <laughs> um, but I am on Twitter and I am on Instagram. In fact, I have several Twitter accounts. One is purely for me to whine about political figures, which I felt was muddy in the waters of my pure literary Twitter. So I have two Twitters plus a Twitter for Book the Writer, and I have an Instagram for myself and one for Book the Writer. Great. Again, we've been speaking with Jean Hanf Corlitz, author of the new novel, The Plot. The book is on sale now, so go buy a copy. And Jean, thanks for doing this interview. Thank you so much, Jeff. I really enjoyed it. Now stay tuned for a brief excerpt from the audiobook of The Plot by Jean Hemp Corlitz, narrated by Kirby Hayborn. Available from Macmillan Audio, wherever audiobooks are sold. By the time the welcome cookout commenced the following afternoon, Jake was running on fumes, having dragged himself into that morning's faculty meeting after a scant three hours sleep. It had been a small victory this year that Ruth Steuben was finally shifting the students who self-identified as poets away from him and to other teachers who also self-identified as poets. Jake had nothing of value to teach aspiring poets. In his experience, poets often read fiction, but fiction writers who said they read poetry with any regularity were liars. So it could at least be said that the dozen students he'd been assigned were prose writers. But what prose it was! In his through the night and fueled by Red Bull read-through, narrative perspective hopped about as if the true narrator was a flea, traipsing from character to character, and the stories, or chapters, were so simultaneously flaccid and frenetic that they signified, at worst, nothing, and at best, not enough. Tenses rolled around within the paragraphs, sometimes within the sentences, and words were occasionally used in ways that definitely implied the writer was not overly clear on their meanings. Grammatically, the worst of them made Donald Trump look like Stephen Fry, and most of the rest were makers of sentences that could only be described as utterly ordinary. Encompassed in those folders had been the shocking discovery of a decaying corpse on a beach. The corpse's breasts had been incomprehensibly described as ripe honeymelons. A writer's histrionic account of discovering, via DNA test, that he was part African, an inert character study of a mother and daughter living together in an old house, and the opening of a novel set in a beaver dam deep in the forest. Some of these samples had no particular pretensions to literature and would be easy enough to deal with, nailing down the plot and red-penciling the prose into basic subservience would be enough to justify his paycheck and honor his professional responsibilities. But the more self-consciously literary writing samples some of them, ironically, among the worst written, were going to suck his soul. He knew it. It was already happening. Fortunately, the faculty meeting wasn't terribly taxing. It was possible Jake had even dozed briefly during Ruth Steuben's ritual intoning of Ripley's sexual harassment guidelines. The returning professors of the Ripley Symposia got on reasonably well, And while Jake couldn't have said he'd become actual friends with any of them, 
he did have a well-established tradition of a once-per-session beer at the Ripley Inn with Bruce O'Reilly, retired from Colby's English department and the author of half a dozen novels published by an independent press in his native Maine. This year, there were two newcomers in the Richard Peng lobby-level conference room, a nervous poet called Alice, who looked to be about his own age, and a man who introduced himself as a multi-genric writer who intoned his name Frank Ricardo in a way that definitely implied the rest of them recognized it, or at any rate ought to recognize it. Frank Ricardo? It was true that Jake had stopped paying close attention to other writers around the time his own fourth novel began to collect rejections. It had simply been too painful to continue but he didn't think he was supposed to have heard of a Frank Ricardo. Had a Frank Ricardo won a National Book Award or a Pulitzer? Had a Frank Ricardo lobbed an out-of-nowhere first novel onto the top of the New York Times bestseller list via viral word of mouth? After Ruth Steuben finished her recitation and went over the schedule, daily and weekly, evening readings, due dates for written evaluations, and deadlines for judging the symposia's end-of-session writing awards, she dismissed them with a smiling but steely reminder that the welcome cookout was not optional for faculty. Jake leapt for the exit before any of his colleagues, familiar or new, could talk to him. The apartment he rented was a few miles east of Ripley, on a road actually named Poverty Lane. It belonged to a local farmer, more accurately his widow, and featured a view over the road to a falling-down barn that had once housed a dairy herd. Now the widow leased the land to one of Ruth Steuben's brothers and ran a daycare in the farmhouse. She professed herself to be mystified about the thing Jake did that got made into books, or how it was getting taught over at Ripley or who might actually pay to learn such a thing, but she had held the apartment for him since his first year at Ripley. Quiet, polite, and responsible with rent were apparently too rare a combination not to. He had made it to bed at about four that morning and slept until ten minutes before the faculty meeting began. It wasn't enough. Now he pulled the curtains and passed out again, waking at five to begin assembling his game face for the official start of the Ripley term. For the ones who get going when the going gets tough, and the ones who know we're tougher together. For the pathfinders breaking new ground, Granger offers supplies and solutions for every industry, as well as fast access to experts and 24-7 customer support. Because we know you have people depending on you, so you can always depend on us. Call, clickgranger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done.